a ten and five, I guess. Yeah, okay. Ten, so five. Oh, so we're watching for all even. Okay. <laughs> That's a good to start getting figured out now. Yeah. <laughs> have one more time. The break in for ten minutes. <laughs> Go <laughs> from the clock to ten to uh, five. <laughs> Goes with God. Like yesterday, the reading was, I went through that. I thought it was like guessing God, but I'll pray for the attack, and then you went up to the town. And then it's like, yeah, and then God comes out of the town. I think people know what it is. Everyone can uh, come in and get settled. We're going to get started here in about 30 seconds. I was really bad with that uh, staircase, but it's yeah, taking a bit of time getting there. Yeah. That's the question to ask. Yeah, totally. Don't worry, I won't be, uh, I'll give you the full time. Even though. <laughs> All right, uh, why don't we get started here? So welcome to the first uh, session of uh, technical talks. Um, this is the pseudo-randomness session. And we'll have two very nice talks. The first will be uh, by uh, Stefano Tassaro and Peter Gatti. Peter is giving the talk. And I'll let him take it away. Good work. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, and what I will be uh, telling you about in the next 25 minutes is about a recent joint project with Stefano Tessaro. Uh, where we looked at how to build uh, pseudo-random number generators and key derivation functions from sponges. So first, let me uh, summarize quickly what our main contribution is. So we give uh, the first uh, efficient and provably robust uh, sponge-based uh, PRNG. And the, t the techniques that we use to, to get towards this goal uh, actually turn out to be useful for uh, also beyond, uh, beyond the, the, the analysis of PRNGs. And they also allow us to uh, to propose and uh, analyze a construction of a key derivation function. So let me start by saying what the sponge construction is, the, the underlying building block that we will be using. So the whole sponge paradigm that is uh, due to Bertoni, Damon, Peters, and Van Asche, uh, it's a, uh, in its simplest form, it's a way how to build hash functions from, from a permutation, from a uh, uh, fixed invertible permutation on n-bit strings. So if you have a message that you want to hash which, uh, with a sponge-based hash function, what you do is you, you parse it into, into R-bit long blocks, and then you start with a state that, is, uh, uh, that consists of n, uh, n zero, uh, zero bits, and we will always be looking at this state as having two parts, the upper part that consists of R-bit and the lower part which, which consists of C-bit. And what you do is you take the first block of the message, you XOR it to the upper part of the state, and you apply the permutation and then you do this for the, the second block and so on until you process the whole message. And in the end, uh, you truncate the output by throwing away the lower part of the state and you only keep the upper part. Uh, and this is the, the output of your hash function. And uh, this, is the, this is the paradigm that is underlying also the SHA-3 winner Ketchak. But uh, sponges go well beyond hashing. I'll just mention message authentication codes, stream ciphers, aut uh, authenticate the encryption as several further applications. And uh, the idea, or the, the main building blocks when you are using a sponge paradigm are always these, these two, uh, two blocks. So it's an absorption into the state of the sponge and squeezing uh, some data out of the sponge by taking the upper part of the state. Uh, OK, so this was a quick intro to sponges. And let's now talk about pseudo-random number generators, which are the objects that we are, uh, willing, we are trying to construct now. So a pseudo-random number generator, as you know, is uh, an algorithm you can imagine as sitting in your operating system and collecting 
some entropy from system events, and uh, then producing pseudo-random bits whenever an application asks for them. Uh, and these objects were formalized in a, in a work by Dodi et al. in 2013, uh, and before, but this is the formalization that we will be using, where uh, the PRNG is seen as having two important procedures. The refresh procedure, uh, that, uh, that is involved whenever the PRNG gets some weekly random input. So these are the, these are the well, let's say, from, this, from various system events. And this, this leads to updating the state of the PRNG. And so obviously PRNG is stateful. And uh, the other procedure that is important for us is the, the next procedure, which is used whenever we want to produce this pseudo-random bit. And this again leads to an update of the state of the PRNG. But on top of that, the, the formalization also considers uh, a procedure called setup that is only invoked at the beginning of the, uh, of the using of the PRNG. And this, this procedure produces a, a random seed that is then given as an input to, the, to both the refresh and the next procedures. And the reasons for this, the reasons for this is similar to, similar to, uh, to the situation with extractors, and I will, I will get, to, get to this in more depth later. And of, of course, this, uh, it is very appealing to try to build pseudorandom number generators from sponges uh, due to the anticipated support that we expect uh, for, the, for Ketchak to appear, both software and hardware support in the future. And uh, indeed, there, there have been proposals of how to build PRNGs from sponges, uh, namely the same set of authors that proposed the sponge paradigm also proposed how to use it for building, uh, for building a PRNG. And you can see the construction here where, where uh, basically, the refresh procedure uh, consists of uh, uh, absorbing the weekly random input into the state of the, p of the sponge, and uh, the next procedure uh, consists of uh, simply squeezing the sponge. Uh, the advantage of this is, is that it is very simple and elegant. It uses the basic, uh, basic structure of a sponge, uh, and it has already been empirically validated in some further work. But the question we will be looking at now is uh, what can we say about the provable security of this construction? Uh, and for that, we first, of course, need a security notion. Uh, luckily, there is already one, which is uh, due to Dodis et al. from the same paper that I already told you about, and it's called robustness. So uh, it's a game-based security notion where we have a two-stage or two-part adversary, which consists of a distribution sampler and an attacker, uh, where the distribution sampler that we will denote D uh, its task is to generate the inputs to the, to the PRNG. So we are assuming that the inputs to the PRNG are also adversarially, are adversarially generated uh, with the only uh, restriction that we require this distribution sampler to be legitimate, which means that it has to provide some truthful estimates of the amount of entropy that is present in the, in the outputs that, that it outputs and th this, that serve as inputs to the PRNG. Um, and then the second stage of the adversary is the attacker who can actually interact with the PRNG and can ask for a real or random challenge. Uh, so in a slightly greater detail, uh, let's take a look at the robustness notion. So here are the, this is our, PR, this is our PRNG, it's three procedures, and the game goes as follows. So first we initialize by, by uh, uh, generating the seed using the setup procedure and initializing, this, initializing the state and choosing the challenge bit, and then the seed is given to the adversary A, to the attacker, and the attacker is allowed to, uh, to query both the refresh and the next procedures of our PRNG. And whenever it queries the refresh procedure, remember that this is the procedure that needs to take some weekly random input, then these inputs are generated uh, by the second part of the adversary, so by the distribution sampler that we are assuming to be legitimate in the sense that I told you. Uh, but on top of this, A is also allowed to do more. It can also compromise the state of the PRNG. It can either uh, read the whole state or uh, override it with arbitrary values. And it can also ask for a challenge, uh, uh, for a real or random challenge. So when it asks for a challenge, it gets either uh, uh, an actual real output of the PRNG or a random bit string, but it only gets a meaningful challenge if uh, enough entropy has been pr processed by the PRNG since the last state compromise. And this is where the estimates from the legitimate distribution sampler come into play. So they are used to evaluate whether enough entropy has been processed already. And then A is uh, at some point expected to output a single bit, representing its guess whether, whether, the, whether the challenge that it got was real or, uh, or random. And uh, the advantage of this distinguisher is defined, or of this adversary is defined in the usual way for a distinguishing game. So this is the robustness notion due to Dodis et al. 
Uh, and unfortunately, this notion was not uh, was not around by the time when the the proposal of a sponge-based PRNG that I showed you uh, came to exist. And this proposal also doesn't satisfy this notion for at least two different reasons uh, that I will walk you through now. So the first reason is that this construction doesn't uh, achieve any forward secrecy. So forward secrecy is a property that is implied by robustness. And uh, in very broad terms, it means that a uh, compromise of the current state of the PRNG should not mean a compromise of the, of the previous values that were outputted by the PRNG. And this is clearly not true for this construction. Just imagine a simple attack that where the attacker uh, asks for a challenge. So in the real case, it would be this output that it gets and then compromises this state and simply inverts the permutation because remember, this is a public permutation to check whether he, the, uh, the challenge he got was actually real or random. Uh, and this problem was recognized in the, in the paper that proposed this, uh, this PRNG, and they also proposed a patch for it, uh, which was to zero, up, uh, zero the upper bits of the state uh, after each invocation of the procedure next. However, this proposal was only mentioned in passing and was not analyzed in that paper. And the second reason why, why this construction is not robust is that it is unseated. It doesn't contain any setup procedures. So. Again, you can come up with a simple, simple attack uh, that, that shows that this, this means that this violates the robustness of the generator. You can simply, simply consider uh, uh, a distribution sampler that uh, samples uniformly over the distribution of all inputs that uh, after processing by the PRNG result in an output that gives you a zero, uh, uh, th uh, that gives you an output that starts with a zero bit. Uh, this will still be a high entropy distribution and it can be a legitimate high entropy source that has to be, that has to have access to the permutation pi. Uh, and it makes uh, it trivial for the attacker to distinguish because it just looks at the first bit. And this is, uh, this is an, an analogy of the very, no very well known situation with extractors and the widely accepted solution there is seeding. Uh, and this is the solution that is also taken in the uh, PRNG world. So, uh, Knowing this, uh, I can show you our pr proposed construction, which is called SPRG. Uh, and I, I can also highlight the differences where we differ from the, from, the, from the previous construction that I showed you before. So the first difference is uh, obviously that we do introduce this setup procedure that uh, samples a random seed that consists of uh, S subseeds, where each of them is an R bit, uh, R bit uh, long random bit string. And then in the, in the refresh procedure, uh, we use the seed to whiten the inputs uh, before they are being absorbed into the permutation, as you can see here. And we cycle through all the seeds uh, as we are g g going to, to uh, further through the inputs. Um, so this is the modification to the refresh procedure. And in the, the, uh, for the next procedure, we implement this uh, upper state zeroing, and namely we, we implement it uh, in a repeated fashion. So uh, we, we, zero, uh, we apply the permutation and zero out the upper part of the state t times, where t is the parameter of this construction. Uh, and also we add an additional uh, call to the permutation pi at the beginning of the, of the next procedure. So this is our construction. It's parameterized by uh, the number of these subseeds, which we denote S, and the number of repetitions, which we denote T. Uh, and the main result of our paper is proving that this construction is, is indeed robust in the random permutation model. And to be able to do that, uh, we, what we first have to do is actually to adapt the robustness notion into the random permutation model, uh, because it was not formulated in this model. And uh, there is also a technical contribution there that turns out to be, to be important, and so I will talk about that first, how to adapt the model, and then I will uh, tell you about the actual result and slightly sketch the proof. So if we want to adapt uh, the robustness notion to, uh, to the random permutation model, the first and simple part is just giving, uh, just considering this oracle uh, that, is, uh, that is a random, uh, uniformly random chosen permutation and that is public, it's available to everyone, so we just, at, uh, we just sample such a permutation at the beginning of the init procedure, and then we give access to pi to all the procedures of our PRNG, and also to both parts of the adversary. So this is the easy part, but now uh, a tricky question comes up. What does it mean for the, for the distribution sampler to be legitimate? Remember that before this meant that uh, the distribution sampler provides some honest estimates of, uh, of the entropy that, uh, that is 
uh, contained in the, uh, in the inputs that it produces for uh, for the PRNG. Uh, but now th this gets more tricky because of the presence of this huge pool of randomness, which is the function table of the permutation pi that is accessible to every, uh, everyone. And so uh, now I will sketch how we define uh, legitimate uh, distribution samplers in the presence of a, of a random permutation pi uh, that can depend on pi. But to do that, uh, let me compare by first uh, showing you how pi independent legitimate samplers were defined in the work of Dodis et al. So there, uh, the distribution sampler simply outputted up upon each invocation, it outputted uh, triple, where uh, the last and important part <laughs> of it is the uh, is the output i, which is which will turn out to be the input for the PRNG, uh, then then some auxiliary information, and then uh, an entropy estimate gamma that is supposed to estimate the amount of entropy that is in this input, and this happens upon env every invocation of d, uh, and th uh, the legitimacy condition is defined as follows. So for every index, so for every row in this table, let's say we look at this index i i. We require that the probability, the probability that this ii takes uh, some fixed value x, conditioned on all the values that are highlighted in yellow here, so all the other inputs and all the entropy estimates and all the auxiliary information, uh, for all the values that these random vari variables can take, uh, has to be upper bounded by two to the minus gamma i, where gamma i is this entropy estimate, right? So. If this is true for every row in the table, then we say that the distribution sampler is legitimate. And this was the definition without considering the, the publicly available random permutation oracle. And now we have to adapt this to a situation where D actually does have access to pi. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, we consider D again outputting a triple uh, we, uh, which again contains an entropy estimate and some auxiliary information, but apart from that, it also contains a source S, uh, which is an inputless algorithm that is only invoked once. It has access to the permutation pi, and it outputs the actual, the actual uh, random variable i, which will be used as the input of the PRNG. And again, this happens uh, upon every invocation. And now we need to define the legitimacy condition. So for that, it, it gets a bit more complicated now. So uh, we, we consider an, another algorithm, which let's call it a predictor, that uh, is given all these highlighted values and is given an access to, to the permutation pi. And so it's allowed to, to derive any values uh, that would use the permutation pi uh, and would need uh, the, the highlighted values. And it produces some view v and then what we require from a re legitimate uh, sampler is that the probability that, and if, f again for every index, so let's take a look at this ii, the probability that this ii uh, takes a fixed value x conditioned on all the, all the yellow highlighted values and on the view of the predictor and on the que query response pairs to the permutation pi of all the other sources and of the actual uh, distribution sampler d. Uh, this probability has to be upper bounded by the uh, by the entropy estimate gamma. Uh, so uh, this is the condition that we require from the distribution sampler to call it legitimate uh, in an environment where it can depend on a permutation pi. Um, and this is what we require here in the definition of robustness from D. Okay, so this is our this is how we adapt the robustness notion uh, into the random permutation model. And now, uh, now we can get to the main contribution where we show that our construction SPRG is actually robust in the random permutation model. So this is the construction that I already showed you and the, the theorem that we prove is that SPRG is robust or the advantage of the ad adversary is small as long as these, these set of uh, inequalities are satisfied. Where on the left side you can, uh, you can see the number of queries that it asks or the L which denotes the total length of the uh, of the inputs that are given to the to the PRNG, and on the right side you can see uh, terms that are parameterized by the parameters of the construction. So uh, C and R are parameters of the sponge. S and T are the number of seeds and the number of repetitions, respectively. And gamma star is a threshold that is used to evaluate whether enough uh, entropy has been processed already. This this is uh, a part of the robustness notion, uh, as I told you. Uh, okay, so so. Uh, and uh, I will state the obvious, these, these bounds are very sim much simplified and you can find the actual ones in the paper. Um, okay, so I will not talk about the whole proof of, of this statement. I'll just uh, give you uh, a sketch of two, two 
uh, building blocks of it that we that uh, we believe are of independent interest. And the first one that I will mention is the so some uh, is a lemma that we call sponge extraction lemma, because we look at how the sponge can act as uh, how well can the sponge act as an extractor in the random permutation model, in the sense of the following adaptive extraction game. So we consider a legitimate uh, distribution sampler in the sense that I told you about uh, that generates a sequence of inputs. And then we, uh, then we consider an attacker that is allowed to choose a subsequence of these inputs uh, without actually seeing these inputs, only seeing the auxiliary information and the entropy estimates. And then the, the attacker is also allowed to choose the initialization value. And then the, then the set of the, these inputs are processed using this construction that you can see here. And then the adversary gets either the real output out that is produced in this way, or it gets a random, random string Y star. And its role is, of course, to, to figure out which of the two cases happened. And we proved that uh, winning this game, figuring this out, is difficult uh, as long as a similar set of conditions is satisfied. And additionally, as long as the adversary doesn't ask an inverse query to the permutation pi on the value y star that it gets in the ideal experiment. Now, uh, this condition might, so might sound a bit unusual. Uh, but uh, there is one reason why we include it, because it allows us to get uh, much better bounds. In particular, it allows us to even say something meaningful if the input is only one block long, which would not be possible without this condition. That's not that hard to, uh, to analyze. Uh, so it allows us for better bounds. And on the other hand, it will not, uh, it will not be a problem for us because uh, when we use this lemma later in the proof, uh, it turns out that we use it only for a restricted class of adversaries that, uh, for which we can show that it would be difficult to ask such a question, uh, such a query. So this is our sponge extraction lemma. And the second part of the proof that uh, I, want, uh, I want to briefly sketch is the analysis of the, of the next procedure of the, of the PRNG. Uh, remember that the next procedure looks like, looks like this. And what we, what we show is that if this state S from which we start uh, has sufficient mean entropy, uh, then this pair, uh, the output of the next procedure and the new state, together are indistinguishable from a random bit string and a bit stri random bit string that starts with a bunch of zeros, uh, also for a distinguisher who is given access to the permutation pi. So this is, this is the result that we get for the procedure next. And, uh, and then I will just briefly tell you how, how from this we can actually get the, the, whole, the, uh, the whole result of robustness. So we go through two notions that were already given in the uh, in the paper by Dodi Zadal, which are recovering security and preserving security. Uh, just very, very briefly, these, these notions guarantee, so recovering security means that uh, the PRG, even if its state is completely compromised, if sufficient entropy is given to it in, in its inputs that, uh, that are protected from the adversary, it can recover full security and start producing random output again, and, or pseudo-random output again. And preserving security means that, on the other hand, if the state is perfectly random, then even if the inputs don't contain any, uh, uh, any randomness whatsoever from the perspective of the adversary, then uh, the PRNG can maintain this random state. Uh, we had to adapt these two notions for, for the uh, random permutation model and show that also in the random permutation model, these two properties do together imply robustness. And this is how we, how we get to conclude that our, our PRNG is actually robust. So to recap, this is our sponge-based PRNG and the main theorem. And let me just spend the last minute to, to tell you also about a second construction that, that we look at in the paper, uh, because it turns out that the tools that we developed for, for the PRNG also uh, turn out to be useful here. So we look at this key derivation function that is also based on the sponge paradigm. You can see that here comes the weekly random source material. Uh, here comes the context variable that tells you the, uh, something about the use of, so it identifies the use of the key. And here you get this output, the, the actual key. And we show that this key derivation function is a secure KDF uh, also for sources. So this source also if this source material is generated adversarially by a pi dependent distributions in the similar sense as, as for the PRNG. And as long as a similar set of conditions is satisfied. Uh, so just to sum up, uh, we give the first efficient and provably robust sponge based pseudorandom number generators. And several of the techniques that we use turn out to have applications beyond PRNG. 
Uh, the ones that I would like to highlight is the formalization of pi-dependent samplers, uh, distribution samplers, and uh, the analysis of the uh, extraction properties of the sponge construction in the random permutation model. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. So we have time for one or two quick questions. Hello? Okay. This is, this is nice work. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask, um, in the kind of standard case that you would use a, a random number generator, you don't actually have starting randomness that would let you do the seed. Is there, a, you, can, you, can you reduce this down to just an, like a computational assumption or an assumption? Because obviously if the distribution sampler doesn't know anything about the hash function you're using, then you can you can just assume it can't choose values that will that will all collide. Is there some nice computational assumption or other assumption you can make to to analyze that case? Because it'd be nice to have that case in your analysis. So, so yes, this this introduction of the, uh, the introduction of the seed is more of a theoretical theoretical uh, workaround to to actually being able to achieve something for distributions that are dependent on the permutation pi. If you are if you are not assuming that the distribution is, might depend on the permutation pi, then you don't need this seeding. Uh, I don't think you, well, you cannot go, go around the need of the, uh, of the seed if you ad, uh, admit that the distribution might depend on the, on the permutation. And this, this seems to be a, like a safer approach, right? To, to assume that, that it, they might depend on it. Uh, but if you are willing to assume that they don't, uh, then you are fine also without the seeding. Uh, with the same construction. Okay, great. Uh, one quick question as the chair then. So why not just use the sponge as a hash function, as a black box, and then build a uh, PRNG from it? Uh, Is that not uh, going to be secure? And then just rely on the properties of the probably sponge? Probably you could do model? something like that. Uh, so one thing is that this is almost black box, depending on how you how you see the interfaces of the sponge. Mm -hmm. You can realize it with uh, absorb and uh, uh, squeeze operations. Uh, and the second thing is probably you could do it on top of a hash function. Uh, maybe you would need more of the calls to the to the pi permutation because it would be somehow bounded by the interface that you have to use to communicate. You would have to hack it into doing what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe there would be an efficiency loss. Great, thanks. Uh, why don't we thank uh, uh, Peter again? <laughs> All right, so on to our second talk.